This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, and welcome to another edition of Hawaii in Uniform. I'm your host, Calvin. And uh, today we're going to be talking, of course, about military and veterans issues also. i got Mr. Steve Kelly who's going to be joining me, who's a veterans advocate. And uh, like I say, we have a lot of people out there in the community who are doing a lot of good things, but Mr. Kelly is one of those individuals who went above and beyond the call of duty in a lot of cases and addressing a lot of the uh, issues concerning the veterans and the military on a legal um, level. Um, I'll let him talk about his uh, background in just a moment, but before we begin, I want to just make a comment. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening here in this country that we are, many of us are woefully unaware of what's happening. Uh, we talk about our uh, service members, the men and women, who are being sent overseas in the name of freedom. And a lot of people have questions about some of the policies that's going on, which is rightfully so. As citizens of this country, we need to be kept aware of what's going on. Unfortunately, what I see, and I think what a lot of people believe, we have a lot of laws or regulations that's in place right now that are created by what I call intellectually immoral individuals. And what I mean by that is that there's individuals who they can weave a verb or a sentence to an eye of a needle. It sounds good, but when it comes out, actually, instead of supporting the democratic process, it subverts it. And I think that's a real danger. We have too many policies right now, especially under the NDAA. Uh, we have policies right now, we'll read something real quick as far as with the uh, veterans are concerned. This is from the uh, World Net Daily. Uh, there's been a, in place, it's called something Operation Vi Vigilant Eagle. And this is a program that was launched by the Department of Homeland Security in 2009. And under this, it includes the returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're being, in some cases, categorized as being extremists, uh, potential domestic terrorists, and, uh, you know, because they seem to be disgruntled or disillusioned, you know. When we start labeling our veterans, like, say, for no reason, we have them put up above Al-Qaeda and a few other different uh, extreme groups out there. There's something wrong with that picture there, you know. Why are these people, like, say, classified as this, and, like, say, and what, and what is the reason for it? And I think a lot of it has to do with the, the way that they've been treated in the past. Across the board, like, say, it's not all doom and gloom, but there's too many circumstances where the system has not really been effective in dealing with a lot of different issues concerning the veterans. It is a popular consensus within the military and the veteran community because based on what we see as far as some of the, the, the programs, the way things have been geared towards the uh, veterans community, is that some faction of the government is waiting for the veterans to die off so they can go ahead and balance the books. Now, this may sound like an extreme statement, but based on a lot of things that's been happening in the past, as far as, like I said, the number of deaths, suicides, the different programs that they talk about having to put into place but seem to be ineffectual, that is the problem. Too many people nowadays where, again, with the less than 1% of the total population is involved in any form or fashion with the, uh, with the military, you know, you seem to miss certain things along the way. And that's why, as you said in the past, it's really extremely important, like say, the citizens get out there and find out what's going on. Where in the cases where the military or the veterans cannot speak up for themselves, they need to know that you're there to back them, that you have their back, because they had yours all this time. You know, and like I say, again, it's unfortunate when we have individuals, leaders, so-called leaders, and different military and also veterans organizations who are, have not stepped up to the plate, who basically have been Judas goats, and that's my opinion, all right? So, again, whatever I'm saying right now, as far as this commentary is concerned, this is based on information that I have that I believe, but I believe that is shared by a lot of people. Right now, uh, I want to introduce Steve Kelly to the program. Steve, thanks for coming on the program. First off, may I call you Steve? Yes. Okay, just the background, like I say, to make sure we, we have a lot to cover, and I know that over the years you've done a lot of things. You made several presentations on a lot of different fronts to a lot of our elected officials about certain rules, regulations, or statutes that have been put in place as far back as World War II and beyond that have been ignored. Okay, first off, if you can give us your background as far as, like I say, not only militarily, but as far as legally, how, like I say, you came into addressing a lot of these issues on a, a legal basis. Well, when I was in service, I was an EEO person, and uh, when I found out that not only was I uh, a lawyer, 
but administrative law judge. So when I got out, I had a problem getting a job. And fortunately, the University of Hawaii then gave me uh, credibility, and so did the state uh, legal system. But I'm a federal officer, and thereby I cannot represent people because I'm still an administrative judge. I can then help the individual uh, argue his cases uh, in the sense of writing what he's done and all the research I've done in reference to why are the veterans getting not really what they're supposed to get by the law. And that got me into research. And the research is looking at what the rules and regulations and policy were that was depriving us of benefits for those who come back. Mm -hmm. As, and those who didn't come back, which affect the wives, uh, the uh, deceased widows, and their children, not getting proper benefits. And I couldn't <coughs> understand this. So I took on myself with the grace of God, uh, helping me to find out why it was going on. And I think I found the reasons for it to be done. Like Calvin said, we have... Yeah, please. I don't want to cut you off. Go ahead. We have people who then have written laws, have written statutes, have written policies that take away our rights. And because when we get out of service, we don't know what rights we're supposed to have. And in that, that's a problem. They send our medical records to a storage facility. They send our uh, personnel records to a storage facility. They don't give them to the individual when he gets out. So he can prove his case. He can prove he got hurt in the line of duty. He can't do that. And when you get, you got to apply for getting copy of your records. You don't know if you're getting all what's there. Okay. Well, one of the things that, okay, we have the VA and we have the other VSOs or people supposed to represent the vets to help them go ahead and get their, their paperwork together. Uh, but sometime, and in, in I mean, I know people who brag about, like say, the benefits they got and they weren't even entitled to, mainly because of people that they knew within the system, you know, right. and that's yeah. been a problem, you know. Well, we do have people, like say, who should be entitled to certain benefits and everything else because they don't know what's out there exactly. as far as the rules and regulations, and they have not been informed about what's going on. They wind up losing out. And something, as I mentioned on the, on the past program, is that this affects, when you have a, a, a family that the money, the, the, the funding has to come out of their pocket to help support a medical condition, you know, that they were legally entitled to receiving, you know, that's a drain not only on the family, but again, it comes back to the community. I know there's a few things, as far as with your, um, the recognition like I mentioned, that you have been uh, championing this for the longest time anyhow. You've been to a lot of our elected officials. You even got a letter from President Obama acknowledging some of your, your efforts. Could you uh, go into a little bit of detail about this letter and the circumstances around it? Well, one of the things that when President Obama uh, campaigned, he said he was going to do something for the veterans. But from the president point of view, he then, like his staff or like all the executive departments, they're supposed to implement the laws. And although he said he was going to do something in the letter, stipulating to see if I had gotten my combat stress disorder and they were trying to get, I never got it. Mm. So in a sense, I don't blame him for saying that he's trying to do so, but there's too many people in the administrative aspects of our legal system who work on a detrimental aspect, which was written in 1958. Yeah. And a lot of their actions are pr primed in this, in this statute. And the statute says that those who go to war cannot get the same benefits as those who don't go to war. That don't make sense to me. But this is a law written by Congress. Okay. But again, we get, we get into these legal, the legalese and everything else. Most well, I'm people, just, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But I'm, I'm just yeah, saying, you know, the thing is sometimes, like I said, when you hear this, and like I say, you're very versed in all this, you know, that's one thing, you know. And I mean, again, I'm really impressed with the, again, the due diligence that you've done over the years because a lot of people don't know 
again, your extensive background as far as you know, what you've given up personally to, you know, to address these issues anyhow, you know. But again, that didn't mean to cut you off, but the thing is when you're talking about yeah. the, the legal statutes and everything else, you know, a lot of people, unless you are an attorney or, or you're a legal person, yeah, right. you don't understand. And that's why I say as far as there are some of our individuals who are supposed to be representing this are remiss because they are not adequately conveying what's in that statute into right. real life terms. And I think I need to quote the statute and, and the date it was done. Yes. And this is a public law, uh, 88, uh, 857 written September 8th, 1958, and it's 31, 38 U.S.C. 1131. I'll repeat that again. 38 U.S.C. 1131, basic entitlements, and it says, for disability rendering from personal injury suffered or disease contracted in the line of duty for aggra or aggravated or pre-existing injury, suffered or disease contracted in the line of duty, the active military, naval, air service during other than a period of war. I will repeat that again. During a period other than a period of war, the United States will pay any veteran those disabled and who are discharged are released under the conditions other than dishonorable from the period of service in which said injury or disease was incurred or pre-existing injury disease was aggravated compensation as provided in this subchapter, but no compensation shall be paid if the disability is a result of the veteran's own willful misconduct on abuse of alcohol or drugs. Okay, to break it down into lay terms, what exactly does that mean? If you went to war, you don't have the you don't have any benefits. That's what it says. They're not going to pay you the same benefits as a person who didn't go to war. Mm -hmm. You're not getting all the benefits. They cut it out. So what happened in 1968, I have a document which says that <coughs> the VA, the American Psychological Association, wrote a DSM, which is a diagnostic statistic book that says it categorizes all the disabilities. Okay. But they took combat stress or combat disorder out of this medical document so doctors could not evaluate and, and provide and diagnose combat stress or combat trauma for persons who served in war. Now in Vietnam, 1969, documentation shows there were 500,000 people, Americans, who were in Vietnam at that time. None of those could be diagnosed for combat stress or combat trauma because it was not in the manual for doctors to do so. So it's not in your medical records. There's nothing going to be in your medical records say that you suffered from that. Even though you go to a doctor, even though you complained about the situation, mm -hmm. you come back to the VA and they tell you it's not in your medical records. How's it going to be in your records if they don't have the right to put it in? Okay, so this was a conscious part on the, the, some government entity decided to pull that out so right. that people, that veterans would not be able to qualify for that. Well, we had to qualify for it. Okay. One of the things we talked about uh, on the previous program, I talked to an attorney by the name of Gary Port, uh, because, like I said, with the DD-214s, there's a coding on there. I didn't know how extensive the coding system oh, was. Oh, yes, it okay. is. And what it does, it, in a certain way, it does deny, it can deny you jobs and other benefits, oh, yeah. but they do not tell you, you know. Most people are familiar with the very basic codes as far as the RE codes, reenlistment codes, right. things of that nature. But when you get more heavy into it, you know, and again, there's some of these things that are not being told and are not being shared. Again, right. it's about having the information source to, you know, to find out what's going on, you know. So what you're saying, you know, I, again, a lot of things that you bring to my attention, it surprises me because I know one of the things we'll get into in a little bit later, I guess, after we take a break, is the fact that, um, Certain documentations, you know, or certain applications that they say can be filed, 
that are, the information is, again, is not readily available unless you know somebody within the system who can guide you through the, uh, through the, the, the maze. But the system is not set okay. up okay. to provide you rights as an employee of the government. So when you come out of service, your discharge on the DD-214 gives you little or nothing because it does not give you an occupation to be disabled from. Okay. Steve, I don't want to cut you off. I'm going to take a short break because I don't want to interrupt you anymore when you get it, you know, as far as explaining yeah. this anyhow. But uh, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back in a few minutes. And, again, this is Uniform in Hawaii. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I have a story, and I don't know where to start. I feel alone in a crowd. I can't sleep. I feel overwhelmed. I don't even know who I am anymore. I still have nightmares. I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. But are you ready to listen? Okay, you're back to with Hawaii in uniform. I keep screwing up the name of my own, of the own, pro, you know, my own program here. Anyhow, anyhow, we're back with Steve Kelly. <clears throat> and uh, Steve, uh, to continue what you were talking about, and again, a lot of things that a lot of people are not aware of as far as, again, the, some the rights, things of that nature. Yeah, before we took a break, you mentioned that there's something else you wanted to discuss. Yes, one of the things that outside of them not putting in the DSM to give the diagnosis and treatment, it's not even in your military records. There's a lot of stuff in war that doesn't go in your military records. It, on your, in the Army, we have a 2-1, mm -hmm. and in the 2-1, it's supposed to lift all the duties that you perform in your MOS. One of the problems of that is they give you an MOS, military occupational specialty, mm -hmm. and when you go to war, you may never work in that, but it's not credited it's showing that you were working outside of what your primary MOS is. Mm -hmm. And then when you tell people that, yeah, I did this, it's not there to be done other than you knowing about what you did. It's not in your personnel records. Right. And it's not classified as a duty performed. So here you're not getting respect for what you may be a cook, but they put you in the infantry out there fighting. Yeah. So here you don't get credit for that unless you get a CIB. Unless it, and, when if, and what the military personnel do if you're not in a combat arms, they'll take those off your records. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know that, uh, well, there's certain jobs that when you, the equivalent to the civilian side, uh, you can get certain accreditations or something? Uh, yeah. Is that one of, one of the, I'm going to read this statute to you. It says, according to the Title 61 of the Civil Service Retirement Act, A, who... Sequently to May 1st, 1940, shall have entered into active duty on naval service or uh, active duty in the land and naval forces of the United States by voluntary enlistment and otherwise shall be entitled to receive, in addition to their military pay, compensation in their civilian position. Okay. We don't know that. We don't know that we have two occupations while we go on the one military, one civilian. So they discharge you based on rank and grade, yep. which does not give you an occupation. You don't have a means of a qualification that you can be disabled from. Okay. This being the 50th anniversary of the uh, commemoration of the Vietnam, I know that there's a lot of, of course, we still have a lot of Vietnam veterans left, but, <coughs> excuse me, over the years, it seems like 
uh, again, they start recognizing all the different things or the flaws within the system in the past. But unfortunately, with so many veterans dying off or losing them at an alarming rate, you know, it seems that, again, it's like waiting after the barn door is closed before they start yeah. doing anything. Right. Okay, what, is, what do you see in a positive vein that may be happening that, you know, is going on, like, say, to uh, accommodate the, the Vietnam vets and also the current veterans are coming right. back because they're, they're still dealing with a lot of issues but in a different time frame. I have created a packet which is about 30 or 40 pages. It outlines all of these things that you did not get at discharge. When you got separated from service, there are certain statutes that stip take away your rights. Mm -hmm. There's a law, it's 38 section 12, 1218. It's saying prior to getting out of service, you got to file with the Department of Veterans Affairs. They're not your employer. Okay. Your employer is <coughs> responsible for all things that happen. That takes away from them having responsibility of giving you benefits, giving, make sure a discharge, you are referred as a qualified disabled employee, which you don't have. Okay. And because veterans, the Court of Veterans' Appeals, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, said veterans do not have constitutional rights because they belong to a right of a group, not an individual. Okay. So thereby, your individual rights are belonging to as an employee. So when you file with VA, their primary emphasis is unemployability, not employment opportunity. Mm -hmm. So in that, you have a hard time getting a job, and the minimum salary that you're getting, they give you a rating of 10%. How are you going to live off $250 a month? Okay. With all the, I know with some of the people viewing, them out there, I mean, viewing the program out there right now, what is something tangible that you can provide them right now as far as, I, they had a couple forms that you uh, showed me as far as applications for combat related benefits? Right, Okay. and trauma. Could you show the audience that and also oh, briefly yes. explain uh, what these forms are about and where they can obtain them? This, this form here is a DD form 2860 that was put out in 2003, and it's entitled Application for Combat-Related Special Compensation. Well, how, we never get this form. Hmm. That you can apply for combat-related injuries, but how are you going to prove that if it's not in your medical records? Okay, well, this form, where do you get that from? And like, say, if you I got it online. Okay, you got it on. Okay, what what web what web source did you get it from? If so, uh, on the disability <coughs> website, I, I Google uh, saying the you know combat injury. Yeah. And I it came up with showing that there were different things, and this this form came okay. up. Okay. On that form, one more time, if you could read the title and also the form number, so oh, that, uh, okay. people can Google it's it. It's application for combat related special compensation, and it's DD form twenty eight sixty. Uh, that was test on May 2003. Okay. And you can go and apply for that and check the boxes, but the information that they're looking at applies to many of the post 9-11 okay. people. And it, they just happen to have Vietnam on there. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that your trauma, your wartime disability is a hard time being documented because when they, you go in and talk to a doctor, for example, militarily, the doctor has a given administrative issue to talk to and give all your information to the commander. They won't tell you what's going on, but they'll tell the command what's, why you came to see him. Mm -hmm. And it's mandated by policy that the doctor do that. Yeah. Okay. I think it's one of, the, one of the important things that we need to do as veterans is that, again, there's many different sources out there, but as far as connecting the dots sometimes and finding out what is out there is a little bit difficult. Even like, say, people, will, they will tell you if you go to it, well, how come you didn't, uh, what, how come you didn't, uh, you know, apply for this? Well, you didn't tell me about it or whatever, you know? But what I'm encouraging, if there's any veterans out there that have any information that could be very, you know, could be pertinent to other vets, 
uh, certain uh, administrative shortcuts that can be taken or any knowledge that you can pass, uh, contact, us here, contact us here at the uh, station. And like I said, we'd like to pass that on, even have you come on to explain certain things anyhow. And Steve, I know you got another form that you uh, wanted to point yeah. out. Yeah, this is a form that was, is a VA form, 210960C5. And it is a general nervous system neuro neurological diseases except traumatic brain injury. Except traumatic brain injury. What do you think you do? What do you think that you're getting when you have a trauma? You have a brain injury, even though you might not have a concussion, but your brain dysfunctions when you have a lot of trauma, when you face death, when you see somebody, one of your buddies get shot, get killed, you know, that's trauma that's facing, that's psychologically affecting your whole body. Mm -hmm. But here you cannot get compensated as a, a service-connected yeah. disability for it. Okay. We're getting down to the wire, but one thing I want to uh, ask you about real quick as far as the neurological thing. Uh, we touched about briefly in the past, but we're going to do a more extensive program in the future about some of the... Um, medical and uh, psychological issues that apply to our, the dependents, because a lot of things that uh, either genetically have been passed on that is not being openly talked about, all these different things, yeah. So with the form you're talking about, um, real briefly, does that, does that include, or is that another? That I don't know. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and do some more checking on that. Yeah, I have to do some more, because okay. I just got this this week. Off of, well, day before yesterday, off offline. I didn't know they existed. Okay, well, we'll do, do some more research about that because we're going to have, like, say, people who are knowledgeable, like yourself and other individuals, to come on and uh, explain to the audience some of the things that we may not be aware of that we should yeah. be aware of. Anyhow, okay, in 20 seconds or less, and I know I didn't want to time you, but any party, any uh, thing you'd like to pass on to the audience? Real yes, quick? one of the things that I do is that I don't charge a veteran for doing anything. I do, this is not pro bono, this is a veteran assisting a veteran. And your wives, your children, anybody who think they did not get proper compensation, proper rights, call me. My phone number is 808-772-6014. Okay. Call me and we can set up a time and any group that wants to issue or deal with this, I'm glad to be there. Okay, Steve, I want to thank you for coming on the program, and I want to thank the viewers for watching the program. Uh, again, like I said, we'll be touching on some other sensitive issues that are essential. But thank you, God bless, and until that time.